Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to another episode of the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Now, is there anybody out there that remembers the days where life pretty much consisted of go to school, go to college, get a job for life, retire, and then check out of this world? They were much, much simpler times, but let's be honest, they weren't that dynamic. And the world has changed so much in such a short space of time. You know, we've got virtual assistants, bookkeepers, webmasters, content writers are all working for themselves online rather than checking in and out of an office with no windows, counting down the days till they get a watch or a carriage clock. Some people will look back through eyes of nostalgia at those times, but they were very limiting and your options were extremely limited. I think we're now starting to question if we're actually more productive in an office where you're not distracted or asked a question every 11 minutes. I think that's the average now when you could just be at home hammering out that work in record time because technology is offering many, many more options now, both to people and to businesses. Whether you have a day job or you want to work from home a few days a week, or if you want to climb that summit on your own and pave your own way with just a laptop and an internet connection, the choice is yours, really. Now, this is where I came across Brian Miles. He's the CEO and co-founder of Belay, alongside his wife, Shannon. And they've become a leading US-based virtual solutions company. But they have over 600 team members, all working from home, all working remotely, with no offices. So without an office, Belay has graced the Inc. 5000 list an incredible three times and was also awarded the number one spot in Entrepreneur Magazine's Best Company Culture. So if they can provide virtual assistance, bookkeeping, copywriting and webmaster services to leaders of fast-paced organisations, it shows you how some businesses are going to be moving much quicker and have more agility than some of the older, more traditional corporations. I think it's a fantastic story and I feel very fortunate to be able to share it. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to Atlanta so we can speak with Brian Miles, the CEO and co-founder of Belay. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Brian. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? You bet. Uh, Neil, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. So my name is Brian Miles. I'm the co-CEO and co-founder with my wife for a company called Belay. We offer virtual solutions to organizations in four different main areas, meaning um, we provide virtual assistants, virtual bookkeepers, uh, webmasters, and also content writers to busy clients, busy leaders, busy companies all over the place. Excellent. Well, like you say there, Belay isn't it an innovative virtual solutions company, and you proudly challenge conventional thinking and align people to positions that help organizations grow. But can you just help set the scene a little bit and just guide listeners through what Belay is, what problems it solves, what makes it unique, and how it's helping your clients? Yeah, so Belay, really the name itself is a climbing term that we really believe in. Um, our job is to serve as a support role to the clients who we see as our climbers, the ones that are actually the heroes and the ones that are going for the summit. And our job is to serve them in, you know, various capacities with our, our with our services. So we always, we see our vision really quickly connected to their vision, what they're trying to accomplish. And so um, through virtual assistants, meaning somebody that might manage your calendar or act as air traffic control over your inbox or manage projects, both personally and professionally. That's one of our services, how we practically serve um, our clients. Another is bookkeeping and payroll. And that's, you know, that's we do our very best to be weapons grade in terms of bookkeeping because there's a big difference between bookkeeping and accounting. And um, we're not the ones that want to interpret the financials, but we really want to be the one that really create great sets of financials and do all the best practices connected to that. So we serve in that way. And then um, from a webmaster standpoint, we find that there's plenty of businesses and and really nonprofits, too, that don't have a personal connection with the person that's responsible for the back end of their website. And if you were to put that person on your team, it'd be very expensive. But for us, we've been able to fractionalize that model with our virtual webmasters. Um, and then the same is true of our writers as well, where we have a writer that's assigned to work with a business or an organization to, be, to develop their voice in all sorts of written form. And um, those are really kind of the four core ways that which we help our clients climb higher. 
I'm glad you mentioned something there a few moments ago. You're talking about the difference between bookkeeping and accounting because I've got an accountant for my obviously books, and then I've got a software package for um, bookkeeping as well, and it's an absolute nightmare. But I think, <laughs> I mean, uh, heard you speak there. I think there's a lot of other people going through the exact same problem because we concentrate on the areas that we're good at and climbing that mountain, but equally you get rid of the things that you're not good at and let an expert do that. And so somebody that's, you know, I outsource my accounting to somebody else and equally the web side of things and the database side of things, that doesn't float my boat either. So it's so important, yeah. isn't it? Well, yeah. And I mean, I joke about this, but it's true. I mean, we do all the stuff that no one else wants to do, Yeah. you know, but we, we do it as best we can because we actually have great people that want to do this stuff and they're awesome at it. And it, when you, when you ask somebody to focus for you and for your team in kind of a more of a fractionalized way, because you don't need a full-time worker yeah. uh, when you're scaling up, and actually some larger corporations approach us because they don't need it either. And so when we're able to do that, it, it enables them to that, – that leader or, or the owner maybe of that business, they're able to focus on the things that really only they can do. And so we're, we're excited to see what that translates to with the kind of the possibility of a client when they have that opportunity to be really focused on what I call their higher payoff activities. So can I take you back in time to where it all began and ask you to tell me the story behind Belay? I mean, was it an idea that you and your wife just came up over dinner or was it something that you experienced in your own day job and thought, you know, we can make a difference here? I'd love to share the story. Um, you know, back in 2010, um, on the heels of the proverbial Great Recession, my wife and I had really good jobs. Um, we both, Shannon, my wife, worked for a, a large Fortune 10 company, um, and I worked for a, a second-generation-owned construction company. I was responsible for the sales of that corporation, and I managed 10 salespeople um, that were on my team, and I was part of the leadership team there. About springtime of 2010, I kind of got to this place where I was I was done traveling. I was exhausted. I was never home. I didn't have a relationship with my kids. I had a good relationship with my wife, but I never saw her. And um, at the same time in her career, she was kind of – her next move in that company after being there for 10 years was going to be a lateral move. And so in that, in that springtime, I also was reading a book. Um, it's called Made in America. It's a story of Sam Walton and how he started Walmart. And in that book, he was 38 in his late 30s when he started Walmart. And I was 35 at the time, and I thought, well, gee, if, if he could start something then, well, why can't I? And um, I since learned that you can start a company at any age and do great. But uh, for me, that was just that was enough to kind of get me thinking in that direction. So I had a great conversation or sets of conversations with Shannon. And over the course of summer, we did our due diligence. We talked to smart people. We kind of got our ducks in a row and we said, you know, let's go ahead and and do this. And so we took all the money from our 401k investments that we had built over the over our career. And we used that as our startup capital. And on October 1st, 2010, we walked into our employer's offices and gave our notice, um, same day. Right. And, and then uh, December 1st of 2010 was our first day officially on our own payroll. So we, we literally went all in on this concept of virtual because we believed in it. And how we believed in it was because I technically had a virtual assistant for seven years that I worked with in my company. You didn't call it that. You just called her an assistant. But she was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and and I saw her maybe 10 times a year, but she got everything done for me on a day-to-day -day basis. And I just thought, you know, there's there's leaders out there that need somebody like Tricia that can really help them both professionally and personally with, you know, things like serving as air traffic controller in your inbox or um, helping me schedule a dentist appointment, you know, all, all the things that got to be done as a leader. Um, and we just said, you know, we, we think this could work. And, it, and then a year before that, um, Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week book came out. And everybody had um, kind of ran to that, but all his solutions at the time were really kind of overseas solutions. And so what we found here in the States um, is that a lot of the clients here value or wanted a domestic solution. Someone in, They were willing to pay for it as well. And so we, we entered the market in 2010 at the perfect time. Um, it didn't – our friends and family thought we were – just ridiculous. Like, well, I can't believe we're leaving great jobs and cashing in our investments for this. But um, that risk has um, paid off quite nicely for us so far. Wow, man, what an amazing story. I, when you both handed in your notice on that same day, was there any element of fear in there? Or, or oh, did you just help you make it work? <laughs> I, uh, so fortunately, my wife's 
corporate office for her was about uh, a 20 minute drive. Mine was a two hour flight. And wow. so I had those, that, that was the longest two hours of my life, I think. And then it was another 45 minute drive from the airport to the office. And I, and I kept on thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, in, in, in all logical reasoning, you know, it just, it pointed to, you shouldn't do this, but it also felt right. Like we, we trusted each other. We, we believe that there was really, truly something to this. And it turns out we were. Oh, amazing. Speaking of stories, I mean, can you also tell me about your book, Virtual Culture? I mean, what inspired you to write that book too? Yeah, you know, that's, um, Virtual Culture is really our company's playbook for how we created an organization over the last now eight years. Um, back in early 2017, so a year ago, we were awarded um, by Entrepreneur Magazine Top Company Culture. And it was an awesome award. We're super grateful for the kind of the prestige that came with that. But of the 50 people that were ranked, and we were ranked number one, we were the only one that actually did it without an office. We don't have an office, and we have over 550 people on our team. And so people approached us saying, well, how in the world have you created something of this size without an office? And so virtual culture is essentially our playbook. Um, on how we did that. It's not the playbook, but it's our playbook on how we've created a virtual company that people love to be part of. Now, I'm sure a lot of people listening will have their own answers to the question I'm about to ask you, but I've got to ask you, why do you believe those old ways of working aren't working anymore? Well, I think for one, there's just a lot of people out there that now have the opportunity to work off their back deck at their house yeah. uh, or from their home. And once that, that happens, they're ruined for life. Because if they have that opportunity and they've got a great job of meeting and good benefits, the concept of them getting in their car and going back to a corporate office space and working in a cubicle is gone. And we're seeing that. I mean, I'm seeing it now more than ever before. When we talk to hiring managers of larger corporations, they're struggling to bring in like that next generation of leader because the mandate is you got to come into an office. And they don't want to do that, and it doesn't matter how much money or perks you throw at them, they're not going to come and work for you. And we're seeing that. We're seeing larger corporations scratching their head. And then you know, on the other side of the spectrum, we see smaller businesses or startups that are saying, I never want an office ever. Yeah. So how do, I, how do I scale this? And it, it's just the, the business owners or the employers of today that continue to um, kind of fold their arms on this notion of workplace flexibility or remote work, I, I just don't think that they're going to be able to ignore it for much longer. It's so true what you're saying there as well, because I must tell you, the very idea of driving to an office or working for somebody else scares the life out of me now. It's, just, <laughs> <laughs> it's something else that makes me just want to make sure that you know what I've built here doesn't go wrong and I look at it. Right. Because you, you can't go back, can you, once you've made that? No. Way? No, and I, I mean, I, I get it if you had to for, yeah. for whatever reason, but most people that have been in an environment where they've worked from home, they're not going back. You know, they're just not. They're going to find another way to continue to perpetuate that. And, you know, there's just so many benefits that employers can realize when they, when they kind of move in that direction. The interesting thing is I, I generally start a conversation like this with this, this thing I kind of joke about, but it's true, and it's the industrial age-itis. It's kind of a it's, – it's – it's this thing that you you have that you don't even realize, and it's the industrial age. Um, if you think about during the industrial age how how things got done, you generally put workers on a manufacturing floor, and then you put managers kind of around them, right? So they watched and they squeezed out the productivity because if they could see somebody, they could control them, which meant that they could put, produce the output necessary. Well. So that was the manufacturing floor. You have people in the middle, and you have managers around them. Well, if you think about corporate office space today globally. It's the same thing. You put people in the middle of cubicles and you put your managers on the walls outside them or around them. And once a person literally has friends that are working from home and they're like, oh, I love it. You know, I've got this great job and I get I have workplace flexibility and I can go pick up my kids from school when I need to. And I, I can be part of something meaningful. And then they hear that when they're working in a cubicle. It's just a matter of time before they're gone. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just it's it's just something that it's a tsunami that's coming after the workplace of of the next decade at least um if not the next decade within two decades it will drastically look different i think 
But of course, when you are working for yourself and you're working on your own, you've got a whole heap of other challenges and obstacles to try and overcome. And I think the big, biggest lesson that I've learned and the biggest uh, realisation I've had is that I simply cannot do it all. And time is actually my currency. That's where I bring value. So what are the benefits of a remote team and workforce for you? And are, are you noticing that people are also having those similar challenges? Yeah, I mean, it from a larger corporation standpoint, if you were to move into more of a remote capacity, the obvious win is in not having real estate cost. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just a significant portion of the, of your expenses goes to that. So your bottom line becomes more healthy to go back into profit sharing, greater benefits, you know, net profit or distributions. I mean, it's, it's a huge win when you move in that direction. Um, but from a time standpoint, I've just had this happen so many times over seven years or eight years being in this business. So I'll talk to a leader when, when they're really honest with me. I'll say, listen, where do you go where you have to get work done? And they will look at me and they know the answer and they're afraid to say it. And they'll say, I have to go home to get some work done. Yeah. And that tells me that the work, that home is a productive place for most people. And so if that's true, and I've proven that it's true, at least inside our business, productivity goes up, results go up, and then what you're doing is you're communicating to your employees, look, I trust you to work from home, so what happens there? Engagement goes up, loyalty goes up. I mean, there's just significant benefits when someone has their time back. Uh, we, have an, we have an employee in our company that she, um, she used to work in kind of a corporate office, um, corporate America type of space, and because we offered her such a drastic difference in workplace environment, she was able to go off of her blood pressure medicine, which is pretty amazing. So what challenges have you faced in leading a remote team? Do you, is, are, do you still get those same kind of problems or is it a different uh, aspect of problems that you have to face each time? No, everything's perfect. <laughs> You're going to say that anyway, right? <laughs> no, we, um, I think one of the biggest things that we've had to overcome is that there you can if you're not careful you can create you can create an environment where certain employees will feel isolated and we've had to be intentional about making sure that isolation is not something that we see in our work culture for our, our for our company at Belay um, so we're we're very intentional to create um, face to face meetings where they can collaborate or get together um, we create we have great tools and resources where they can collaborate um, we have a kind of a personal element to our um, our Fridays, we call it Friday high lows, and they can post anything that's a high or low professionally or personally. So, you know, maybe a low is that their son's struggling in school or their low is that maybe a, a client left our company or a high could be that they're going on vacation next week. And so we bring this personal element to our corporate team that that really um, seems to to knock the walls down, you know, in terms of um, it being a remote or virtual thing. And then, you know, we do other fun things like we occasionally do a call a virtual happy hour where we'll get everybody on a huge um, Zoom call and it looks like, you know, a million Brady bunches, but <laughs> we'll celebrate together and everybody will grab their favorite beverage and, and cheers maybe an award that we want or something, we an announcement we need to tell our team about or, you know, we'll use that as an opportunity to kind of vision cast inside our business or um, we, we just do our we're very best to bring what would, maybe isolate somebody back into the fold as quick as we can using technology and then also you know face-to-face -face meetings where needed so when you created this vision what kind of impact were you hoping to have on today's workforce and the future workforce too i i had no vision other than to um create a good service when we first got started um this idea that um i could write a book seven years in it was the furthest thing from my mind um, yeah, I wanted to create, my wife wanted, wanted to create a company that we were proud to work in and be part of, um, uh, and serve our clients really, really well. We've, we've just been blessed with the opportunity to then communicate really what we've witnessed over seven years. Um, my job is still to, as a CEO of this company is one to open doors for our business, but two, um, really point people to where we're headed as an organization. And um, that really lies in our ability to continue to serve our clients really, really well. And then, you know, the byproduct of that is when you do something really well and you get known for it, you know, you get the opportunity to write a book uh, and kind of share your ideas and what you're seeing. And so that it's been incredibly rewarding um, to write this book. My wife is actually writing a book that comes out in April called The, um, the Third Option. And in essence, it's it's a book about how when when women have babies, 
they're they're really faced with two options. The 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 first option is that they um, put their baby in daycare and they go back to work, or they basically stay at home and they kind of miss out on their career. And, and our organization of Belay has really created a third option where you can have both, and of meaning. And, um, and so I'm really excited for her book to come out later, uh, well, in April of this year. Fantastic. Yeah, it's great to hear as well, to hear how women are being empowered there and being able to, to have that third option. She, does she have a lot of success stories behind that as well? She does. And, and, and it's also her personal story before when we had, um, our, our daughter, our first child, yeah. um, it was before we started our company and she was faced with this dilemma and she, she basically went in and proposed an idea to her business and they accepted it. And it, it got us thinking as we've created belay over, over, you know, that, Hey, this, this is really a viable thing that we are creating a third option for people that are really stuck where they, they really want to have um, a foothold in their family, but they also want to maintain a career. You know, we, we see it all the time. You know, there's, there's really great people that, um, had babies, you know, and stay at home moms and stay at home dads that had been out of the workforce for say five to 10 years. And they come back and they're like, they're, they're afraid to enter the market because they feel like they've got no current experience. And, and oftentimes corporate America will shun that. Yeah. Um, so we've just basically approached it different. And we just said, look, corporate America can marginalize stay at home moms and stay at home dads and also um, kids of aging parents. We've seen that as well, um, but we, we won't because we know they're great people and they've got great experience. They just need to be caught up on some technology in most instances, but they're amazing people that we want representing us and our company. And so we've, we've literally made a third option available to now hundreds of, of folks that represent us on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, I think I also need to mention that you're not just sat at home, working from home, managing your virtual workforce there. You do get out and about still. And I believe you've just returned from South by Southwest. I mean, how was that? Any great lessons or stories yeah. from that trip? I mean, what did you get out uh, of it? South by is just an incredible mix of culture, um, commerce, arts. It's just it's it's awesome. I mean, we, uh, we we had the opportunity to present. My wife and I presented on our virtual culture, and and um, that was a really cool experience and an honor, really, to represent Belay at such a cool conference. But you know, there's four hundred thousand people that attend this conference every year, and it's um, it's kind of like sensory overload. You know, you're one minute you're you know hearing from NASA on the latest and greatest, and then the next minute you're hearing a, a guy read a book a, a, about something he wrote. And then the next minute you're in a podcast recording for a comedy show, you know, and then you're then you're going to a movie premiere because they're releasing it there. And then there's a billion bands, you know, and food galore. It's just it's kind of um, it's just it's overwhelming, but incredibly fun. If, if, if you if you're a listener and you've not gone to South by Southwest, I'd highly encourage you to attend. It's it's um, it's a fantastic place to network to and advance your business. Oh, man, it's high on my bucket list of events because I do get to go to the U.S. quite a bit uh, for various events. And Southwest by Southwest is one that always just misses me. So yeah, I it's, need it's to amazing. sort that out. And it's great barbecue, too. You can't miss out on that. Oh, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, before I let you go, could I just ask that you remind the listeners of your website URL, where they can find your book, of, and equally contact your team with any questions about our conversation today. You bet. Um, our, our website is just simply belaysolutions.com, and we're very active on social media. You can find us on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and so forth. And then in terms of my book, you can go to virtualculturebook.com, and then also, if you'd like to check out my wife's book, you can go to mythirdoption.com for that. And then um, if you're interested in our services, fantastic. Um, what we would do is when you when you fill out the web form on our website at belaysolutions.com, you will actually set up a phone call with one of our solutions consultants to listen to your needs and just make sure that we're a good fit for each other. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, um, we're, we're um, helping you make a good, wise decision when you're um, hiring or considering virtual solutions for your organization. I absolutely love your story and how you've gone about it now and using technology to create your own future. I also love Belay's name, too, and how you it actually mean something. You know, your services equipping leaders and organizations with the ability to climb higher when they need it most. So I think it's a great story. So a big thank you for taking the time to come on today and share it with us. Thank you very much, Neil. I really appreciate this opportunity. What a great guy. I mean, I could have chatted with him for hours. And after recording 
Brian was telling me a great story of how he nearly signed for Aston Villa, which is a football club just down the road from me, which is currently standing in the way of my team, Derby County, from being promoted, but that's another story. I love how Brian spends his days running his company virtually from his porch in Georgia, from the mountains in Jackson Hole, or from the beaches in Panhandle, Florida. And if you're listening to this podcast on your way to work now, this opportunity is there for everyone. I really think it's important to hammer home the point that no other generation has had the technology in place that would allow them to instantly set up a business, publish their own book, broadcast a podcast or radio show to 165 countries, all at the click of a mouse. And I do talk about this a lot because I know so many people talk themselves out of things. And if that is you, think about what you're good at and what is your why. And then go out there and make it happen because that technology can make it so much easier for you and and give you opportunities that your parents, your grandparents or great-grandparents could only dream of. But it's not just about individuals. I love how Brian also pointed out there that businesses are struggling to get the right people now when they're expected to be in an office office five days a week. There really does seem to be this huge transformation going on right now and technology is right at the heart of it. So let me know your thoughts about today's episode. I mean, after all, this is your show too and your input is just as important and probably more important than my own if I'm honest with you especially if this is your area of expertise. So please tweet me at Neil C. Hughes, email me techblogwriter at outlook.com and remember you can listen to all of the episodes as we race towards episode 500 at techblogwriter.co.uk slash podcast and you can also leave me a quick voicemail there as well and I would love to play some of those on episode 500 so please keep them coming in. But I'm afraid we've reached the end of today's episode. So all that's left for me to say now is a big thank you for listening. Really do appreciate it. Until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.